right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining. Welcome to the first edition of the New York City Hospitality Alliance's Tuesday Talks. Today is Prepare Your Operations for 2021. We've got some amazing uh, operators and experts in our field here today. So, so excited for this conversation and um, hope that this is truly insightful for all of you attending today. I uh, want to let you know, too, that our next discussion is on Tuesday, November 17th. That one's going to be at 3 p.m. Uh, the politics of hospitality, then we will have our uh, third iteration of this series on December 1st. So you can check out all the details on our website. That is nycalliance.org. Uh, and that is also where you can find more information on membership um, on the Alliance as an organization. You can find out more about our recent efforts, sign up for our newsletter. Uh, you can find us on our social media, all of that through our website. Again, that's nycalliance.org. Org. Um, and if you are not already a member of the New York City Hospitality Alliance, we encourage you to join. Um, of course, we would love to give you more information. So feel free to drop a note in the chat uh, or the Q&A and we can get you some more details on membership there as well. Uh, speaking of membership, we're very excited about the sponsor for today's discussion. Uh, Tarlo is a proud member of the New York City Hospitality Alliance and again, sponsor of today's talk. They're a New York-based CPA and business advisory firm. Uh, Tarlow services clients in uh, a wide range of industries for over 80 years. The firm's solutions-oriented accounting, tax, and advisory services have resulted in positive long-term results for their valued clients. Uh, the restaurant and hospitality service group at Tarlow specializes in helping restaurant and hospitality owners address today's challenges and prepare for tomorrow. Uh, their partners and professionals develop customized plans for business owners to optimize their bottom line and growth plans. Uh, throughout the pandemic, they've worked closely with owner, operators, franchisees, franchisers to help with the CARES Act, Paycheck Protection Program, loan applications, loan forgiveness process, managing operations, uh, reopening resources, and more. So if you'd like to learn more about Tarlow's Restaurant and Hospitality Service Group, please contact us. You can send us an email uh, at the Alliance by uh, shooting that to info at the nycalliance.org. So thank you so much, Tarlow, for your support, and thank you for your membership with the Alliance. Uh, and Without further ado, I would love to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, uh, Rick Kamek. He is the Dean of Restaurant and Hospitality Management at the Institute of Culinary Education. We're so delighted to have him here. He's going to tell you a bit more about our panelists today, and uh, we are so excited for today's discussion. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Savannah. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Jeffrey Bang from the A la Carte Restaurant Group. We have Philippe Massoud from Alili Restaurant and Alili Box. We have Blair pa 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 Papagni, I'm sorry, Blair, from uh, Anella Restaurant. And we have Trines Woods Black from Sylvia's. Welcome, everyone. Morning. 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 Uh, uh, obviously, the, uh, the pandemic has uh, created a lot of havoc, a lot of change. Uh, we've probably all been through quite a bit. Uh, we've been through these many times over the years, but this is probably the toughest one yet. One of the things we've most likely learned is we need to be multi-channeled. Let's uh, kick off the questioning with uh, Jeffrey. Uh, what offerings have you added since the pandemic? Uh, from Hi. the dining room, I would say we've offered additionally nothing. We've actually scaled back, trimmed down the menu to prepare for you know less staff, in the kitchen so that we could be more efficient. On the outside of the menu, we started uh, having a company jar our Carmine sauce and we sell it on our website and all the uh, proceeds from it go to our employee relief fund. So far we sold about 10,000 jars that way. It's been doing a phenomenal way to give back to our employees and try and help. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it says, I don't have to tell anyone on this call, it's rough right now. Whether you have a strong brand or, or not, it's just uh, an, an insane time. I would assume, you know, somewhat obviously you're already heavy in delivery and takeout, right? Yeah, delivery and takeout have been great on the Upper West Side. That's like a neighborhood. Times Square um, is non-existent, so we're not even open there. Vegas, we're doing really well. Everyone is young and dumb, for lack of a better word, in Vegas. Atlantic City is doing well uh, in, in spite of Phil Murphy's attempts to keep uh, the restaurant industry closed down. Um, so, yeah. They got delivery, obviously, going to be strong. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Trines, have you added anything to make up for a lack of uh, lack of seating? 
No, um, much like Jeffrey, we've had to scale back. Um, our menu is very extensive and um, our labor, wow, we, ha we had about 117 employees prior wow. to COVID just with our one location. So um, we've scaled back on our menu tremendously. And one of the big things we stopped doing was uh, offering breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been really difficult um, during this time. Turning up the labor you know, force. Yeah. yeah, it's just, you know, streamline as much as possible to to just be able to um, have a little bit of space to, to make a profit. So we've, we've cut our menu back. Okay, Blair. Hi, guys. Um, so we were not uh, a real takeout delivery heavy restaurant at Anella. And we had to shift a little bit into uh, that category. And we've started to offer, we do uh, a dinner for two where you can get two pastas and a kale Caesar and a bottle of wine uh, for 60 bucks, which I think feels like a really great uh, value for our neighborhood. Um, certainly we have cut back in other ways. I feel one of the saddest things about this pandemic from a restaurant perspective is what I call the death of dessert because we just can't afford, Trinas, you feel that? The death yes, of dessert? Yes. Yes. It's painful. Yes. Um, it's painful for several reasons. One, my kitchen actually really loves to make dessert. It's like a joyful thing that the kitchen does. And sadly, we just can't afford to have someone sit at a table for another 20 minutes, half an hour to share a panna cotta. I wish that we could, mm -hmm. but we're not in that position right now. We are beginning to think about maybe we could do dessert on a Thursday night, a Sunday night, and then maybe offer it to go on the weekend so people could take mm -hmm. something home and enjoy it there. Okay, let's uh, let's jump over to uh, let's get right into the tough questions. Um, obviously, we've all been squeezed uh, 25%. Uh, we we're all hoping for 50% soon. It didn't happen. Uh, can you make money at 25% or even 50%? And uh, what changes do you have to make in order to to keep your head above water? Trinesse, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, you really can't make money at 25%. Um, although, you know, takeout and delivery, the 25% and making sure that you have all the staff that's needed to be in compliance, um, what we've noticed is that it hasn't yielded a, a profit. You know, like we're, we're lucky if, if we break even. Right. and turning turning the tables and having to bring in additional staff to um, have them dedicated to the dine-in experience and still manage your takeout and online delivery it's been really really challenging um even the the exits um creating the thoroughfares like everything has been an absolute um challenge i mean i um, my dad is our CEO and, you know, I'm, I've been chatting with him about maybe we should just wait until we can get 50% and we really need to know immediately when that's going to happen. I mean, the next big holiday for us, which is our highest sales day is Thanksgiving. Yeah. And, you know, people want to make reservations and we're literally in a hold pattern. Yeah. You don't know what to do. And, we need to know something because at least, you know, so, that could, could, uh, could help. So right now it's more about employee retention, keeping your name out there. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, Jeffrey, thoughts? Yeah, I, I thought I signed up for a uh, talk today. I didn't know it was going to be a comedy show. The funniest thing you've ever said is, can you make money at 25%? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's trying to make money. We're all just trying to survive. I'm literally going to turn into the Bernie Sanders of the restaurant world. It's, you literally need a restaurant revolution going on right now, speaking to our politicians every day. We generally tell our staff when they come to work, spend 30% watching you know, what you want to do today, 30% planning for the future, and 30% putting out today's fires. Everybody needs to spend 30% of their day actively talking to politicians and lobbying and explaining to them that this industry will not be around. America's first job 
is not going to survive the next three to four months. It's a joke. We've made it this far. God bless everyone on this call for everything they've done, you know, whether they, you know, mortgage their home, work themselves, everything they're going to keep their employees working. But there's nothing you can do at 25 and 50 percent. People have an incredible amount of debt. We were closed in Manhattan for almost six months inside. Anyone who's even breaking even right now, which is a little comical, still owes a tremendous amount of money to vendors and this and that. This is just brutal. I find it completely ironic that the press and the rest of the world has not picked up on you have an industry that was shut down. It's bad enough to be working through a pandemic. Some of my friends in offices and this and that in manufacturing, they're having less sales. You don't have a fighting chance when you're shut by the government. Yet you still need to pay your expenses. And oh, here's a PPP program that's geared towards office workers. Maybe you guys can make use of it. And oh, by the way, we'll tell you the rest of the rules later, you know, when we get around to it. We need some bipartisanship. We need people in New York to be reaching out to senators outside of New York and telling them how dire this is. Because what's going to happen is all these good people are going to wind up folding who had viable businesses before this COVID. And then, yes, in 2022, lots of people will open up restaurants again because that's what happens. They'll put a fresh paint of, you know, fresh coat of paint on a store and they'll reopen. And then there's going to be a, a generation of people that were decimated who had really strong viable business before this. And I know people are looking going, oh, Carmine, you'll be fine and this and that. And we probably will be. I'm on this call, and part of the reason we started the alliance is to help other people. And people need to start reaching out to their politicians on a daily basis. Sorry for the rant. <laughs> Blair? Yeah, I want to say, I mean, Jeffrey's totally right. We're on this call together, and Carmine's is huge. And really, congratulations for the success that you guys have had. Um, I'm definitely the small guy or small lady on this call. Um, you know, when, when I was able to reopen to start to do takeout, I did that when we could do indoor dining. Um, the reason I only do right now, Thursday to Sunday, is because uh, I work every single shift that my restaurant is open. You know, on the weekends, it's brunch and dinner. I have three kids. And it's not a sacrifice that I'm making that I don't want to make. I want to be there. I love my restaurant. I opened it in 2009 and have been really, really lucky to have had uh, extremely hardworking and responsible staff that has stayed with me and to be in a neighborhood that has grown with me and supported me. But what Jeffrey is saying is absolutely correct. We will not make it if we are not allowed to open at a higher capacity and if we're not given more support by the government. You know, when you say that we are people's first jobs, it's true. How many people do you know who have successful jobs in other fields today who started out in restaurants? So many people were able to move to New York City and be a musician, be an artist, be a writer, because they could also be a waiter or a bartender or work in the kitchen. You know, we, we are job providers. We are neighborhood anchors. We are more than just a place that you go and get something to eat. We are a community. And to lose us would be devastating to New York City. Well, you just segue to uh, the next question. Uh, let's talk a little bit about staffing. So, Blair, have you done more with staff? How, how have you done more with less? Um, so how I've done more with less is I spoke to my kitchen and I said, look, guys, um, I can bring back an extra person or I can pay you guys more and you don't have a dishwasher. And that was a decision that we all made together where I said, look, you know, this is I, I have a limited amount of funds that I can pull from to not make a profit, but break even. So here's how we can do it. And I can honestly tell you that there are many nights where I'm running around and I'll also run into the kitchen and do dishes. And I don't think that what I'm doing is something that a lot of my peers are not also doing. Um, I need this restaurant to work. I need it to survive. I already closed one restaurant that had been open for 13 years, not because I wanted to, but because the reality of having a 20 seat diner, it was not going to survive this. And I did not have a cooperative landlord. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I'm really literally trying to do more with less. When I talk to my other restaurant friends, we all say, 
we're not as busy, but we feel like we're working twice as hard. How is Trinas? Yes, do you agree with that? How is that possible? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Um, my family, you know, we, we have about three generations in the business and literally um, from the oldest to the youngest, it was like all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. um, just working around the clock and everyone is absolutely exhausted, absolutely exhausted. And the staff that we, that um, did come back, you know, they're tired as well. And it's, we need assistance. I mean, the, the bottom line is, you know, like you said, and restaurants, we are the fabric, we're the glue that holds the community together. We're the ones that's feeding the community organizations. We're yeah. the one that's making our neighborhoods safe, um, our lighting outside, just our mayor presence makes the community safer. Um, we're, we're part of a lot of people's mental routine, um, the jobs. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on. And if the hospitality industry is not saved, you know, America is going to look extremely different, extremely different. Well, I know that you and I both have, because I know your restaurant, because I've been there, that you and I both have these uh, neighborhood restaurants. Yeah. And, and I, I can answer this question with zero, being the number of times that I have said no to a public school coming to me and asking for a donation. And yeah. I know that you can say the same thing. Absolutely. And people are more in need of those donations now than ever. And guess what? We're no longer in a position to do that. We need to be able to be here so that when people ask us for help, we can help them. That's and part that's of the hardest life. part. Um, just quickly to that, Rick, I just wanna say that's the hardest part. Um, we started a pantry in May and we were very fortunate to um, receive a, a return call from the National Action Network and Reverend Sharpton and the CARE organization. And so when we started the pantry on Sundays while other pantries are closed, you know, of course it starts out with a lot of the people that are homeless or may have mental challenges. And as the weeks turned into months, we started to see our regular customers, our regular guests online. And that was really, really difficult. Yeah. And for, for me, when, when the, the money ran out, you know, for, for the partnership, you know, I literally cried. I was like, I'm crying because it's not that we stopped serving because there was no longer a need. We stopped serving because we couldn't afford to. And when we started, this is the first time in, we're a year and a half from 60, that we haven't been able to support the community. And, and what I'm saying is the same for every restaurateur. You know, we are the backbone, we support our communities. And for, for the government not to recognize our contributions across the board is just utterly baffling to me. I, I don't think they don't recognize, I think it's almost insulting because here you, here you have, if you look at what's played out over the last six months, we all know where we are in terms of the pandemic, but try and remember where you were in March. You didn't know what you knew today. So yeah. everyone was told we're gonna quarantine, which nobody even knew what that really meant back in the day. We could be locked in your house. We could be let outside. You know, my wife was very concerned. She was going to be locked in the house with me. Everyone had a lot of concerns. But mm -hmm. that's the restaurant industry. But you guys stay open. Stay open and feed everyone who's going to mm -hmm. go to quarantine. We're going to ask you to be frontline workers, but we're not going to treat you like frontline workers. We're going to ask your servers and people to go out and about, but we're not going to provide you any N95 masks for your employees. We're going to tell you maybe you can go find your own masks and maybe you can find a nice blue mask or something that will fit your outfit well. But we're not going to supply you with N95s, even though you're going to you know, serve customers or you're going to talk to people. So they want to treat the staff like frontline workers. They want to ask us to help support a quarantine, which is something none of us ever experienced in our lives and hopefully won't again. And yet at the same time, they don't acknowledge. They're like, oh, the restaurant people, they're all complaining. We gave them outdoor dining. They have five tables in the streets. So when people walk down the street and they see five, they see all the outdoor dining busy, 
people get excited and go, oh, I see you're doing really well. I'm like, really well? We have five tables, okay? I have 105 tables inside that are empty and I have five busy outside. Just to go back to my point, and people might be thinking, great ramp, but what do we do? Yes, you reach out to your electeds, politicians, locals, and ever. And then you also, a lot calmer than me, talk on social media about this. Talk about how you need, open up your heart and say, I need your support. We supported you with your schools and soccer teams and this and that. You need to support my employees. And that's what I'm very particular about when I talk, because people always say, Jeff, you don't need help. And thankfully, I don't need help, okay? I need to help my employees. I need to get 1,300 people back to work. If you talk about it on social media and explain it, People don't really understand. We take for granted that people think they understand the restaurant business and that maybe you're lucky you're making 10 cents on the dollar. They don't understand it. And every time, just like we do with our own brands, in absence of information, people make up their own information and their own decisions. So if we're not talking more on social media about this, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, whatever your thing is, you're not getting people to echo. And then whenever you're doing something, add a link. Say, click on this and it'll go to Chuck Schumer. This will go to Nancy Pelosi. This will go to that or that. Look on the Alliance website and take some action every day. I think we got a, we have, you know, like 150 people on this call that get it and are probably sitting there going, yeah, I know, I get it. I'm suffering too. You have to reach out to electeds because there aren't really too many tricks left in the bag of what's going to get us through the next three months. And if someone has one, I'm happy to listen. Okay, well, let's think about, let's talk about some things that, that we can do in the meantime. Uh, do we raise prices? Does that make more sense for less seats? Does it make sense to lower prices to get more turns? Jeffrey, you want to take that? Oh, God. Any restaurateur knows saving prices is the scariest thing in the world, let alone before a pandemic. I mean, now, during a pandemic? Yep. So, you know, it's rough. You know, we had an opportunity to use uh, the New York City, uh, you know, allowed us to have a surcharge. We've not implemented that. I'd say about 50% of our guests ask us that even while they're making reservations. So that's not gonna really help us because we can't really do that right now. Uh, definitely afraid to raise prices. Um, like I said, we're, we're just trying to keep our customers happy, turn anyone into the dining room into a takeout customer if possible, keep our takeout customers engaged. Um, people have more choices than ever for takeout, which is ironic. You're asking everyone to do takeout to survive right now, but now everyone's doing takeout, so it's even more brutal. Um, I think raising prices is, is, a, is a bad move. I think people prefer and always appreciate value. Does it make sense to lower prices, get more people in the door? Is it possible? I don't know if anyone would notice if I lowered the price, except for my bookkeeper. <laughs> uh, Blair? Same question. Um, so I, I did not do the COVID charge. I just felt like, I've always felt like it's more honest to just raise prices. Um, Let's give you my next question. Did you do the COVID charge? Uh, okay, go ahead. I didn't do the COVID charge. I feel like the way the COVID charge was rolled out was a mistake. To make it a percentage and not some sort of a flat fee didn't make sense to me. Um, I know that you could choose to charge. Up to, and it was also up to that amount. But you know, to me, a percentage-based charge basically means that if someone comes in and gets a nice bottle of wine and a steak, that they're almost being penalized uh, as opposed to the person sitting next to them getting a burger. But the amount of PPE that uh, they're using or we're using for them is not increased. The whole charge, it, it truly didn't make sense to me, but I don't judge people who did decide to use it because maybe it makes more sense for their business. Mm -hmm. Um, what I did, which is what I've always done when it comes to raising prices, is I pick one or two items on the menu, the best sellers. Maybe I raise the burger. Maybe I raise uh, cocktail prices. Um, I did raise prices a little bit here or there. I've always wanted to be seen as a value. I've always wanted someone, when they're done eating at our restaurant, to get their check and say, oh, wow, that wasn't bad. Um, to feel like the meal and the experience that they had was worth more than what they're paying. Yeah, I don't think anyone's looked at value more closely than they do today. So uh, it's definitely something you got to think hard about. Uh, Trines, uh, your thoughts? Yes, um, we we didn't um, put on the, the surcharge either. I mean, Raise any prices, lower any prices? You no, know, um, we're, we're in a position right now where you know, prior to COVID, we had already done an increase. So there was no way that we can turn back around and, and do another increase. So 
Mm -hmm. um, I know Philip's over there. Philippe? Uh, where is Philip? Do we have Philip? Yeah, I've been here for almost uh, an hour. I Philip, I'm so sorry. I, I only see five boxes on my screen. I, I, I'm so sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> the conversation. No worries. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're, we're talking about um, raising prices, lowering prices, or adding the surcharge, and, First, and whether that makes sense or not. Uh, so if I remember correctly, our audience is an audience of operators that are right. looking for ideas. Um, I think we all know that we've done everything we can with our politicians and legislators. And at this point in time, it, I, I think it doesn't serve our audience any good to, to go over that. I mean, yes, we all need to leave no stone unturned. Um, in regards to surviving the pandemic, I think there is two strategies. One is uh, of survival, and the other one is uh, is of brand continuity. And and what survival means that you're operating at break even or the least amount of loss, so that you can last long enough, so that when things turn around, you're ready to pick the fruit of your struggle and your hard work. Um, and in, in that sense, raising prices right now for me is, is an absolute no-no. Full menu engineering, uh, meaning all the items that, so for example, we used to hand cut fries, you know, are my guests going to be pissed off that I'm no longer cutting my fries by hand and I'm machine cutting them now? I don't think my guests give two, sh two dams about that. And therefore it's a compromise I'm willing to make in regards to the production of my fries. Um, and, and, and really going through menu item by menu item to create these efficiencies in production so that you're, you're managing your labor costs correctly. In regards to the surcharge, we debated it and we're still debating it. And now that gloves have gone up to about $90 a case, we had access to gloves at $44 a case, then they went up to $75 a case. And now we're getting fleeced by the vendors because I think they're all kind of organizing themselves because they know that now there is the surcharge and since we can collect the surcharge let's jack up the prices because then they'll collect the money and they're not being penalized for it um, the surcharge i think um, should be an optional one if the guests want to participate then great they don't want to participate don't impose it on them um, and 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 that's that's kind of a good practice uh, so to speak in the end of the day, um, I just want to point out to everybody, wearing a mask is what will keep us open. Um, Taiwan has 23 million citizens. They've had no more than 700 dead. Why? Because the citizenry wears masks, because the citizenry follows the science. As long as we are constantly debating whether this is a, a, a pandemic or not, um, we will be pardon my French, in deep shit for a very prolonged period of time. And until we all collectively start taking this virus as seriously as we can, um, we, will not, we will not survive. And, and that's really what the problem is here. 25% um, is barely survivable. God forbid the mayor announces another shutdown now, that will be decapitating. Um, you know, and I think we will all march to our uh, graveyards, uh, business, business wise. You know. um, so that's, that's my little input for, for now. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I apologize uh, that I didn't uh, get you in earlier. Um, no segwayed into the next question, uh, and that is, you know, have you streamlined your menu and are you re-engineering your menu? So you just touched on that. You want to follow up a little further on some other things you've done with your menus? I mean, listen, uh, we pivoted in, so we created, we left no stone unturned in figuring out all possible revenue streams that you can get outside of the restaurant. Gold belly, Baldor boxes, uh, uh, you name it, uh, mail order. Uh, so you have to go and canvas the entire internet uh, market and see what it is that you can do to be able to generate those extra sales. And on the delivery and takeout, believe it or not, we're offering deals at $18 for a sampling meal and $24 for a full 
you know, appetizer, main course, dessert, meal, um, while some of our entrees are at $34. So we've offered everybody, and it's called Elili Cares, uh, we've offered everybody an item for everybody. If you're bargain hunting and, and you're pinching pennies because you have a budget, there's something for you. If you don't care and you want to support the restaurant and spend, there is something for you as well. And all these different revenue streams, be it Gold Belly or Baldor or, or uh, you know, delivery and takeout, help sustain this 25% disaster that we're experiencing. And then, you know, the forthcoming winter weather, which so far we don't have any clear guidance on how to use butane heaters, you know, on. So that's what we've done in regards to the menu. And yes, we've shrunk our menu for sure. Okay, um, you're good. you just segued into a next question, but before we get there, uh, let's talk about um, uh, some other people's thoughts about menu engineering, uh, re-looking at your menus. Uh, Blair, any thoughts there? Um, well, one of the interesting things that happened for us was in that period of time that we were closed and then when we reopened, but it was only um, a, a part-time reopen, um, my chef, I was able to get him a job at another restaurant and he had been with us. Uh, he started as the dishwasher when we opened in 2009 and he worked his way up to every position. So he's really been at our restaurant for 11 years. And this was the first time he was able to really get out and see some other things. And he learned some new skills. Um, we now bake our own brioche buns in house, which we didn't do before. Um, so I like to think that there are some positive things for us that have happened during this. Um, menu, menu wise, we trim things a little bit because the labor that was involved in it before French fries is definitely one of the changes we made also, which I think is just one of those funny universal things that, uh, the public doesn't really understand the amount of labor and mess involved in French fries. It just seems like an easy item and it's absolutely not an easy item. I had mentioned dessert before was something that we had to change um, in order to really streamline brunch also and be able to do it with less people. We've stopped doing uh, eggs Benedict. And in the past to make these kind of menu changes, I would have thought, oh my God, well, I, we can't not serve a Benedict, that's crazy. And I just always have to remind myself it's COVID, it's COVID. People understand we can make changes and for the most part, the public is much more understanding about these adjustments that we've made. Um, and the other thing that we did, which I had not done before, is we have started the credit card processing fee, um, which we had never done previously. And it was one of those things that when I really sat down and looked at the books that I felt like would um, be a very, very small expense to pass on to the customer and in the end would really be very helpful to us in being able to have a little bit of extra money for labor. Jeunesse, uh, menu changes? Yes, um, the biggest one for us was breakfast. Um, you know, our restaurant is open, well, normally pre-COVID, we're open from 8 a.m. until uh, 10.30 at night. So now we open at 11 without breakfast. So that's been really, really hard. Um, the only breakfast staple that we have are, of course, waffles for chicken and waffles and, and a nice pot of grits if someone wants to pair a protein with it. But I, I miss eggs. Um, biscuits. Biscuits were, were huge. Um, you know, our customers are like, oh, well, can't you just make biscuits and the truth of the matter is we couldn't make the biscuits, we couldn't make the banana pudding um, because we couldn't afford to, to have our baker um, come in and, and do that product. And for a while we couldn't get bananas. Um, we had to take short ribs off the menu for, for a bit because the price had just um, gone so high that there was no way that we could um, you know, pass that on off to the customer. So we've had to, to make some serious changes. And I would say that one of the hardest is, is breakfast because 
um, brunch was something uh, that was very good for us. When prior to COVID, we had brunch as well as our full menu. So it kind of like uh, balance out, but, you know, having your eggs cooked to order, you know, that grill space, it, it was just a hard decision um, that we had to, to make. So now, so yes, our menu has um, changed significantly. Um, uh, Philippe touched on this. Uh, let's segue over to uh, technology. Jeffrey, anything you're doing to uh, make use of technology that's aided you during this time? Yeah, um, back in April, we reviewed our tech stack and then we decided, you know, what would we want to get into and whatnot. We'll give out, you know, some tidbits. So we kind of went all in on Olo in our delivery. It's been phenomenal for us. Uh, obviously, we're, we have a cap. Everyone has that 5% cap right now with the seamless and grub hubs of the world that's helping us, but that's going to go away at one point. So we're working with Olo. We released our own app last week and we're working on pivoting our customers to that. So when we come out of the pandemic and we lose the 5% cap on surcharges, Olo sometimes only takes bigger groups, unfortunately. So Chow now is a great opportunity for people that who, who are, might have you know one store or one off. And it's a great opportunity right now to take advantage of the 5% cap with your DoorDash, Postmates, rub up to get people to see your brand, but then convert them to your own customer base. So when you come out of this, you can get away from those third parties. The other thing we'll put out there, which probably everybody knows, so I'm sorry if I sound preachy, just trying to help. Contactless payments are just, are, are not good. You got to be very careful. So there's a lot of mobile pay where you can scan on your on your um, check a QR code and punch in. And we find Manhattan, unfortunately, like anything else, is very quick for people to figure out about fraud. We literally have customers sitting down at the table, opening up a little notepad with like ten different credit card numbers, trying different numbers till one of them pops because it's a card not present transaction. And then all of a sudden, you're very excited about your contactless payments that people are scanning the QR codes. And you're going to get WAP just like back in the day when EVM, uh, you know, started. So we find successful more bringing the device to the table, letting people tap on that. They can still use Apple Pay or Google Wallets or their or their wireless part of their card. That's healthier for you. You won't get chargebacks, and it's still contactless. We're not very big fans right now of mobile pay because the fraud in New York was got to be insane at a certain point. Jeff, uh, Olo as in uh, interface between the point of sale and the delivery platforms? So Olo does all that stuff. Olo allows you to be your own online ordering system, whether through the website or through an app. It allows you to interface um, Postmates, Caviar, DoorDash straight into your thing, and it injects it right into your point of sale and gets rid of your tablets. And no, it's not like an infomercial. But you don't have to then re-enter the orders, which is everyone's, you know, weak link in right. the process. Yes. Um, Chow now is a Charlie great product for that too. Like Charlie and Order Mark, which are all having major issues constantly. Uh, right. And a, and a lot of that has to do with if you're interfacing more than one product into your point of sale, it's not going to work. So the quick workaround, if you interface one product to your point of sale, it'll probably work fine. Once you add a second, it doesn't work. And the secret is buy a very inexpensive $500 second server and put the product on that server in your office and this problem goes away. It's an easy workaround that I don't know why people don't, you know, the, the tech companies don't tell you, but multiple products trying to interface your point of sale don't work. I mean, unless you're in the toast world, which is built for interfacing. Yeah. Um, I, th thank you. That's very, very, very helpful. I wanted to just go back very quickly in regards to the kitchen and menu engineering. Uh, we've canceled stations, so we used to have a grill, a fry, a sauté, and a garmanger station. We've merged our grill and sauté station because the volume of business is not there, and therefore we split the refrigerator into a sauté refrigerator and a grill refrigerator, so that we don't need to have the same amount of individuals manning the station. That's been very, very helpful to us, and we don't, you know, because the volume is not there, and by default you don't need that. So I just wanted to mention that to. Uh, our attendees uh, as an option as well. Philippe, anything else on technology like that? I mean, unfortunately, you know, we've always lagged in technology in our industry because of the amount of turnover there is and the, the lack of investment. Therefore, um, we've been having nightmares with uh, Chowley and, and other and other brands. So I'm going to look into Olo. Thanks, Jeffrey, for mentioning it. Uh, um, but uh, and contactless. Payment is erratic, uh, it's slow. 
Uh, we've tried to put in those cameras that read the, the guests' temperature. Uh, they've turned out to be horrible because the moment you dim your lights in the dining room, they don't read as fast and therefore they're creating a backlog. So we've gone back to the laser thermometer uh, quickly. We've implored open table to help us collect the contact tracing information instead of having to handwrite it and create the backlog and asking resi to do the same but again we've gotten no no love i know they're working on it they're just open tables behind on it you know they did the same thing they laid off a lot of employees and then they had to like get everybody ramped back up but i do know it's a priority yeah yeah everybody's working on it double time you know uh but you know those are things that are creating backlogs. But uh, besides that, uh, no, nothing new on technology for now. Uh, Blair. Oh, um, well. Any technology changes, upgrades. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm just kind of old fashioned. Like I, I like to believe that I can still just run a small neighborhood restaurant by myself. Um, I don't have Resi. If you want a reservation, you call the restaurant or you email me. You will most likely talk to me if you call. I will so I'll back. Um, every night before the ship starts, I draw out the floor plan. Um, as people come in, then I fill it in if, if it's walk ins. Um, uh, for uh, takeout orders, you call in or, and this only happened pre pandemic, uh, you can now order through our website. Um, I update the website. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just feel like for me, I, I didn't get into this industry um, because I had any strengths in the technology field. And while my husband will probably die if he hears me say this, I don't have an interest in growing in that direction. I want to believe that I can keep doing things the way I have been and we can get through this and I can go back to just being a regular that's, little that's neighbor. That's a segue well to a future question. Uh, <laughs> Ernest, same thing, technology, any changes, anything that you've benefited from? Yes, um, we've had to ramp up the technology in a way like, like never before. So we have all the delivery partners um saturday our system went down we couldn't take any cards it was a complete and total nightmare all day so it's um the technology is one of those things where i'm definitely going to look into the um a, an additional server because prior prior to everything um we didn't have all these delivery partners we only had maybe two so now we have like all of them and um, the system is very, very uh, finicky. Yeah, there's been a lot of fraud, um, walkouts, things like that. But yes, um, we've embraced technology um, and we're, we're trying to do the same thing that Jeff suggested, um, like with Chow Now and we have our own app and trying to just capture as, as many um, customers as, as possible so that when we can part ways with some of the, the uh, delivery partners, uh, we should be in pretty good shape. Okay. Rick, just uh, one quick, Rick, one yeah, quick thing. So I didn't say, we, the, someone asked me on the chat, we use pay my tab is how we use the payments at the table, mm -hmm. uh, process EVM and credit card, sorry. Okay, cool. Um, so everyone's touched on this a little bit, but, um, you know, whether it's technology, it's masks, it's standing six feet away, whatever the case may be, service is clearly a challenge today. So how do you offer a great service in such a challenged environment? Uh, Blair, why don't you uh, kick that one off since you touched on it? Um, I, I think that it starts from the moment someone walks in the door until the moment they walk out of the door. It is the warm greeting it is the trying to seat them, if possible, at the table that they want. Um, we How do you have, smile? <laughs> I think, look, you can tell I'm smiling. My eyes get a little smaller. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's about uh, the thanking the people who are returning, the welcoming the people who are coming there for the first time, the accommodating special requests where we can, where it's not going to affect the flow of the kitchen. I think that that has not changed. The hospitality industry 
at our core has always been a place of yes. That's where we should always be coming from. If we can do it, we should do it. I think now more than ever, if people are coming in and choosing to spend money with me, I need to be able to express gratitude to them. Um, my staff, which I've said before, and I can say a thousand times, is incredible. The people who chose to come back to work, I am so loyal to them. Um, I talk to them to make sure that they feel comfortable with the work environment that we're in. They do. And I think that our overall positivity, it flows out to the customers. And I, I will say that I do think that because of our reduced capacity, I feel like we are putting out the best food that we have ever put out because our kitchen is not slammed like it has been in the past. Right. I think every plate that's going out is a great plate. Yeah. Okay. Good answer. Um, you know, uh, I agree with you completely. I do think we're challenged, but I, I do agree with you completely. Uh, Philippe, uh, your thoughts? Uh, how do you offer great service today? I think, um, you know, hospitality is a lot about nonverbal cues and um, our expression through our eyes behind the mask is, is, is worth a lot. And we've all become experts at reading expressions through the mask. Um, there's a kind of a mystique behind it, to be honest with you. It doesn't bother me that much, personally. Um, I think, you know, in regards to hospitality and interaction with the guests, we've gone through kind of a, a, a curve in the sense that when we got out of quarantine, everybody's hearts and minds were open. There was a celebratory uh, aspect to dining out again and getting some sense of normalcy and seeing life sprout through the sidewalks of new york city again uh now we're getting some people are getting into the routine where you know they're they're comfortable complaining about a chair being uncomfortable versus all the hard work that we're doing and all that but um you know you never budge um and 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 you have to constantly remind people that we are in a pandemic environment and we're doing everything that we can to make them as comfortable as possible and, and, and do that both for our staff and our guests. But the masks definitely, you know, being more expressive, it's like bringing in Broadway, you know, <laughs> you're in live theater, you have to be a lot more expressive so that um, your, your, you know, your message comes across so that you got to do that with the mask. Uh, I mean, to some degree, I think we're, we're simplifying the challenge a little bit. I mean, you know, people walk in, you know, some of us are telling people that they've got 60 minutes to eat, they've got 90 minutes to eat, you got to put your face in front of a camera. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things we're asking people to do that are the antithesis of hospitality. Uh, I mean, the, the challenge is, is, I think, a bigger one than, than we're speaking to. Uh, Jeffrey? Oh, yeah, I just want to say it's how I'm you sorry. say it. Because, yeah. you know, you tell a guest, um, you know, just so you know, I have another reservation coming in for this table in an hour. You know, I think that if if you let people know the expectations, that again, helps a lot. Mm -hmm. most people understand this is COVID. We are a small restaurant. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to turn those tables. Yep. You're always going to get the people that are not going to be happy, for sure. But in general, I think that people are expressing a much higher level of patience and understanding. You think that lasts? If, if, I can, if I can add, I think there is a very strong sense of community in the overwhelming majority of New Yorkers. We've all gone through hell and back together. None of us have escaped this. And by default, there is a sense of community. Um, and hopefully that stays and, and, and will grow. Probably, maybe not, maybe I'm, it's wishful thinking on my part. But I really think that that's brought us closer together. And you know, you, you're still going to have the occasional 5% or 2% that are going to be angry and pissed off no matter what you do. And, and those, no matter what you do for them, there's nothing you can do. In, in that respect of community, I think it feels a little bit like post 9-11. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Jeffrey, yeah, your, your thoughts about the same topic? Um, I, our customers, I would say, are 50-50. The earlier in the day, the more accommodating they are. And as the night goes on, they're not. Um, and again, I, I always like these seminars, try and give out whatever tidbits we can that help. And you know, I hate when I sound preachy, I'm just trying to help. One of the things we found very successful is during pre-shift, and it's gonna sound you know corny, but we literally have the way staff and the, especially the hosts and hostess practicing raising their eyebrows um, and cheekbones because you'd be surprised, you can make some smiles in this and that. 
but people don't realize under your mask when you're smiling, um, you know, that you're happy and you're okay and you're glad they're here. So, you know, nonverbal cues, like Philippe said, are way important. And we all know that in this call, but you really got to drill that down to the 19 year old that's working your front desk, who's trying to explain to you why I need your address. Okay. Cause the customer's like, what do you have to give me my address? I just want to eat some pasta. Like, you know, don't make this a big deal. Um, so we find as the night goes on, it gets a little rougher with that and a little more challenging for the staff, reminding people, put your mask back on when you go to the bathroom and come out of the bathroom. You know, there's a lot of issues. I think as the night goes on, it's harder. Um, but the guests generally across the board have been tipping more. Um, for sure, tips have been up. So I think it's a little easier for the waiters to, to you know, try and practice a little harder on their nonverbal cues. I agree with you guys. I think it's a little 9-11-ish. You get some goodwill and this and that, but people forget very fast. I mean, I walked down the block after 9-11 and everybody was nice to me. And I'm clearly I'm Mr. Hospitality, you know, and everyone was warm and talking to me. Um, you know, but that fades away real quick, unfortunately. So we'll see. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Trinesh, you want to add anything to that? No, I think um, I would just echo what everyone else said. <laughs> okay. Uh, let, let's segue over to uh, permanent or uh, permanent, I'm not sure, uh, outdoor seating. We can throw propane into the conversation as well, but let's talk a little bit about the challenges of outdoor dining, of building additional outdoor seating. Is there an ROI or a return on investment there? Uh, how expensive was it to do it? So on and so forth. Uh, Philippe, you want to speak to that? Sure, uh, my, my pleasure. Um, so we have been imploring the city to give us a long-term plan to help us recover our revenues. In order to do that, we need outdoor dining for possibly a year, if not two years. If the city had the courage to make the right decision, once we know that we can do outdoor dining for two years or, or not forever, or forever, then we can deploy the necessary funds to do something that is safe and proper instead of doing all these half-assed solutions that are not going to last through the weather. They're not going to last through the snow plows. They're not going to last through the blizzards. And we're not going to be able to use them when the weather gets really cold. And I have been imploring, imploring every person I know, every contact I have to please stop the madness. Let's sit down at the round table and come up with something that makes sense that is temporary or permanent so that we can do it correctly for our guests and more importantly for our employees and to generate much needed tax dollars to this wonderful city of ours who is on the ver that is on the verge of bankruptcy. However, nobody's answering nothing. Many of us have been obligated to do things that are not kosher, quote unquote. Many of us are using outdoor heaters that are not legal because the way the regulation is written is impossible to comply with. And um, I, I am still holding off on waiting to hear from somebody that can tell me how the hell it is that I can do outdoors correctly without violating every rule in the book in the city. Because if you're building something that's more than 400 square feet large, you have to file with the DOB. Has any, how, many file, how many filings does the DOB have right now? Zero, you know, and, and it's tragic. And I don't know what the administration is waiting for. They need to invite us, sit down at the table and have some common sense. They've been using outdoor heaters in Washington DC for God knows how long, maybe 30 years. Not one accident, but somehow outdoor heaters in New York, whoo, 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 they behave very differently, you know, they have legs and they're gonna run around and they're gonna explode. And, and mind you, they tell us, oh wait, you can put four tanks in your car. So we have all these wonderful car bombs driving all over New York City right now with four tanks of butane in them. I mean, it is insane, some of the stuff that they're putting down our throats. And, and unfortunately, it's not because of lack of hard work. It's not because people don't have the right best of intentions is because you have people that are tunnel vision in regulations that are living in an alternate reality that is a book of regulations that was developed for many, many decades. And they're unable to see the practicality, the reality, the business mind aspect of it. 
so that they can make the right decision. And that's where we are. We're fighting a system that is so entrenched in regulation that common sense has evaporated. Actually, it's a lost uh, molecule. It doesn't even exist, you know, and, and, and that's where we're at. So forgive me for ranting, but it's okay. I am so frustrated about this. Uh, you and a lot of other people, uh, Jeffrey, yeah, I think you may have some thoughts about this. Yeah, I think Philippe hit the nail on the head. The thing for all our people on this panel is propane heaters are basically not legal in Manhattan. It's a very simple part of the end of the fire department code that you have to be the heater has to be five feet away from the building, a wood chair, a wood table, and a person if the person has clothes on. So if you have naked diners, you're fine. If you have any of your guests have clothes, naked diners on plastic seats, they need to be five feet away. So you cannot legally have a propane heater. You may get lucky and the fire department might not come by, um, but we actually were nice enough to have a visit from them last week and had to immediately take away our three propane heaters and told me that he had visited 20 other places that day and all 20 were in violation. They were nice enough to explain. We asked, what do we need to do? And he's like, there's nothing you can do. In this small environment, it's not legal. So, you know, I'm, I'm clearly a doom and gloom guy and that's how we, we roll, but I don't think anything gets better till, till we're out of COVID in the spring because my prediction is the Blasio will read the post today and see the Alliance had a great article about why propane heaters aren't legal and that his rules didn't work. They'll say they're going to announce some people to make some changes, this and that. They'll announce changes and then a week later the fire department will say those are still no good. But really they're all just sitting and waiting for January so that a chunk of money can come, uh, you know, from Biden to fix all their problems. So right now no one's really going to do much in the city. You might get some propane rule changes so that they don't have to give us the 50 percent thinking that will shut us all up because we didn't get 50% dining, but look, we gave you propane heaters if people are wearing some clothes. You know, I don't know, it, it's it's nuts. I wouldn't I wouldn't look at propane heaters are gonna solve our problems in the next couple of weeks. I think, um, you know, even even people should know your, your outdoor cafe in the street. So if you, put so if you put sides onto that tent, if you put three sides onto that tent, it's now considered enclosed dining and you can only have 25% capacity in your outdoor dining, if I said that properly. So right. two sides of the tent up, it's outdoor dining in the outdoors. If you have three sides up in your outdoor dining, it's now indoor dining, 25%. I mean, come on. And, and We're all set up for failure here. I mean, that's at the end of the day. You know, I, I, I totally respect, you know, Blair is doing what a, a lot of independents are doing. They're doing everything they can. They're working hard. They're taking care of the staff. She's doing everything she should do. The whole important Part of having a social safety net is to also help the restaurants as well and i don't know why other people don't get it yet if if i may add those most of us when we built our restaurants have tapped out electrical panels so it's not like we can just walk to the store and add you know twenty thousand watts of outdoor heating from our panel with a new breaker and new amperage uh, just like that by the flip you know number one number two um, if they do not allow butane heaters um, and, and legalize them, whereby you know you can get a service that's refilling you overnight, not overnight, that, that picks up the next day, you know you can keep the tank in the heater locked up and whatever, um, it's going to be it's going to be a total disaster. I mean, it, it's impossible. Uh, actually, mind you, mind you, if you have God forbid an accident, you're done because you're personally liable. Yeah, that's why you can't use the, that's why you can't use the heaters right now because they're not legal. Exactly. And there's it's an accident. It's you're insane. done. It's total insanity. Well, if you want to then talk about electric heaters, now you've got a whole other problem because most of us don't have the amperage to be able to run them. Uh, oftentimes, especially for some of the small independents, you may have a 200 amp circuit, which is no way you're going to run an outdoor additional uh, service out there with with the amperage that you have. Uh, uh, any challenges? Uh, anything you've done there? So. For me, we had a, a really substantial fire in 2018, and I had to take out a $100,000 personal loan. So I'm still digging out from that. So for me to invest more money um, and really have no clear guidance on what's going to happen, the weather has been nice enough mm -hmm. that uh, we have a back garden. So we've mm -hmm. been feeding back there. Um, 
people ask me, oh, are you, are you going to get heaters? Are you going to enclose it? I just don't feel comfortable at this moment with yeah. not knowing what the city is going to have us do in the next month or the next week even right. to invest any money in that. Yeah, and, and so then, comes, then comes December. Uh, so for me, I'm sort of in a holding pattern right now. And if it becomes viable with yeah. the guidance they give us to put some heating back there, I will. But I obviously agree with you guys completely that while we are technically allowed to do propane, there are so few spots that can actually do it correctly. Maybe there's a beer garden somewhere in Queens that can pull it off, but most of us really can't at all. DC has so much of their, you know, their shit together. Not only do they have propane laws and this and that, they just came out with a grant to help the restaurants buy propane heaters. So you can apply and the, and the city will buy you propane heaters. Now, clearly, they, the city also has no income. No one's paying any taxes into that city. There are no guests in this and that. But they found a way to say, hey, how can we help the community? I mean, exactly. I, just, I just got a commercial rent tax bill this week. How much should I pay on that? Still negotiating with landlords, still trying to work it out. There's no guidance on you should be paying your commercial rent tax on your full flight uh, on your rent, or you should roll the dice and pay on what you think you're going to wind up working out with your landlord, or you should pay on your, you know, the abated amount or the deferred amount. The city doesn't take any time to actually understand that there are a tremendous amount of unintended, because I don't think they intend it, but unintended consequences to their lack of decisions. And it just goes on every single day. Yeah. And, and all, the, all the city needs to do is gather people around the round table and, and let us help them. We, there are thousands of people that are willing to help. You know, nobody's picked up the phone. Nobody's called us. Nobody said, hey, listen, let's sit down. Let's figure it out. Let's make it happen. You know, and we're here to help. We're all good citizens. We all care of our, about our neighborhoods. But this drip, drab, you know, it's like they're marching us slowly to our deaths. And, 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 and they need to realize that the clock is ticking and it's ticking extremely loud as the weather cools down. We will not be able to sustain the jobs that we've been able to resurrect uh, if the city does not step up to the plate. I cannot, you know, uh, stress it enough. Well, to make matters worse, obviously, we're coming into our coldest months. Uh, we don't have a good feeling for what the future holds. Uh, so we're, you know, we're coming into tough times, Cl clearly help is needed. Um, let's talk a little bit about marketing. Uh, how do you market in today's world, Trinesse? Well, um, it's all about content, content building, and it's, it's very, very hard for, you know, especially like single unit operators to concentrate on marketing and social media and making sure that you have content and keeping up with all of these new holidays that pop up. It's National Fried Chicken Day or National Languini Day and all, all of that type of, um, type of stuff. But just in, in how you can um, keep in touch with, with your guests, um, as much as possible. I mean, it's, um, doing that through email. No. Yeah, definitely email, social media, and every opportunity that you can, um, be interviewed, um, be in front of a larger platform, you know, take that opportunity, um, make sure that you're engaging with your, uh, trade organizations, your community organizations. Um, again, Thanksgiving is coming up. We know that there's a lot of people that are going to have a really, really um, sad holiday. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get turkeys, you know, a turkey partnership to give out turkeys in the community. The prices are going up like ridiculous, like literally every single day, the price is fluctuating. So um, the normal things that, that we, we would do, you know, push people to want to come on Thanksgiving, but we're trying to just be mindful that, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are struggling, you know, unemployment is, is through the roof. And so we've, we've taken um, a sort of gingerly approach 
you know, to, to our marketing. Yeah. We, we want to, we want people to come and dine with us, but we also know that there's a, a huge population here that can't afford to do so. So, um, yeah, it's just, we're, we're in a, we're in a time. So, uh, you know, I wish I had more, more to say, but you just don't feel good about, well, for example, Black Restaurant Week is starting. It's a, a, a new restaurant uh, initiative. And, um, you know, we decided to go ahead and, and do, do that restaurant week. We didn't do the other Harlem uh, restaurant week because we, we were just like, hey, we're, we're still trying to figure out operationally you know, what we're doing with the takeout orders here, the online orders here. Ugh, it's a lot. It's a lot. And, you know, we don't have money to market. You know, we don't, we don't have money. You know, I haven't taken a, a, a salary, <laughs> you know, um, since this whole thing has started. So it's really interesting. Blair, any marketing tips? Well, it shouldn't surprise you because I'm sure you guys have a good sense of me by now that <laughs> I would not be big on um, any kind of traditional like um, paying someone to market for me. Um, we did right when the pandemic hit for the first time after 11 years, we started to have uh, merchandise. I had uh, someone that used to work for me at one of the restaurants that I closed um, print a bunch of tote bags for us and we sold those to benefit the staff and sweatshirts. And once we sold out of those, I just did another round. And I guess my idea with marketing is um, in my neighborhood, if I see someone walking around with an Anella tote bag or a kid with an Anella sweatshirt on, um, to me, that's, that's advertising for us. And uh, it, it shows people's uh, loyalty to our restaurant that they would want to buy that and wear that or put that on their kid. So I guess the, the merchandise aspect of it was a way for us to get our name out there a little bit. Um, I, not surprisingly, do my Instagram. Um, I'm not a big Instagram person, but I do see the value in that as a tool to reach an audience, um, whether it's to let them know like, hey, here's a special we're running today. Um, Anella runs a special almost every day because uh, I, I do feel like in, in a more old fashioned kind of restaurant, that's what you do. The waiter comes to the table, they have a special that they can tell you about and it gets the guest excited. So for us, I guess uh, it is a combination of uh, a little social media and a little just getting our name and our brand out there to right. our neighborhood. Some internal marketing. Yeah. Uh, Philippe, some marketing thoughts? Um, I mean, I think it's all about, uh, there's two strategies. One is brand preservation. If you're closed, I strongly urge you to continue posting, even if it's from your home, your apartment, should you plan to reopen? Because it's important to keep your, your guests and your followers engaged or know that you're here and what's going on. Um, if you're open, obviously, uh, yes, you have to be ready and, and, and willing to, you know, go through your Instagram postings and, and, and send your emails, keeping your mailing list uh, educated and, uh, you know, up informed as, as to what it is you're doing. Um, I think uh, branding is actually, uh, uh, marketing is more important during these difficult times than it would be otherwise, uh, because you have to stay in touch and you have to stay relevant uh, because you got eyeballs on this, you know, we've all our new master, right? Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and therefore uh, it's very important to, to keep your marketing efforts during these difficult times. Yeah. Uh, Trines had a drop off. Thank you, Trines, for joining us. Uh, we'll keep it going a couple more minutes and then uh, we'll open it up if there's any additional questions. Uh, Jeffrey, any thoughts about marketing today? Yeah, just give something a little from a different perspective uh, besides social media and that we found a huge success in reaching out to nonprofits, uh, university alumni associations, UJA, and offering our staff 
to do five minutes before whatever they're doing. It could be a board meeting, it could be a seminar, whatever they're doing on their Zoom, Zoom calls, we'll send a bartender and a bartender will open it up for them and talk about a Carmine's drink that you know you can only get at Carmine's. We'll send a chef for something else. We'll send over the ingredients. The organizations love it because it gets a little more than just, oh, we're having another meeting or, or this and that. It's only five minutes. It's Zoom. It's easy. Obviously, you have the team you're sending out there because they're representing your brand and all the fun technology stuff that can go wrong. The other strong suggestion I have is just old school, it's just bounce backs. Take advantage of when you have your customer. So if you're going to get some people for Thanksgiving, then you should be offering in that bag or restaurant a bounce back for December, for January ahead. Listen, I hate coupons and I'm not a coupon guy, but you know, living with COVID and trying to figure out how to survive, you got to give bounce backs. If someone's there on a Saturday night, you got to tell them that Monday is, you know, half off wine night or whatever you're doing, because you only get very small surgical strikes at some customers right now. And yet we still have seven days in the week or there's no elusive eight day. No one's, and I haven't found that yet. So every day of the week. Um, but the five minutes before Zoom calls with organizations have been huge and just reach out and ask them and then go back to your employees and yourselves. And that's where you find the organizations from. All your employees have two, one or two or three organizations that they love, their church, their temple, whatever. And they're always happy to do this. They do not think of it as a commercial. They think of it as, as a value added and they're happy to do it for you. Great. Um, okay, uh, tough question because I'm sure none of us really know when we're coming out of this, but uh, what would be a, a new normal strategy for, uh, for coming out of this, uh, for coming out post COVID? If anyone wants to <laughs> venture a guess on that one. When do, you, when do you think we'll be back to normal? What do you think is a, a strat, what strategies are you employing to come out of this? I don't, I don't, I don't know how much strategy you can because there's so many movable part targets. There yeah. could be another round of PPP. There could be the restaurant act somehow miraculously gets passed in January, which would change all our lives if that was passed. Um, the vaccines could work. The vaccines could not work. I, I think we're, we'll like if you can get. I think people can be getting to some calmness in the summer, maybe a little easier to break even, maybe in the summer because you'll be back to some outdoor dining. And I think after we go through, unfortunately, a rough winter with COVID and cold, people are always happier in the spring anyways. So I have a feeling the spring, summer, we're gonna be okay, feeling good about ourselves, light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe the rhetoric is gonna get toned down now that you know if Biden's president, the media might tone down its rhetoric and maybe that'll make people feel better. And then I think fourth quarter, will be good and whoever's still breathing in uh, in uh, 22 will be doing phenomenal. Um, I, I, I'm not as optimistic as Jeff. I think that... Um, I was optimistic? As, well, it's partially optimistic. I think we're, uh, we're going to be through tough times up until probably Q1 of 2022, uh, unless there is a viral treatment that is like a ZPAC, you take it for five days and somehow you're cured. Otherwise, we're going to continue going through peaks and valleys of infection and, and abatement and infection and abatement um, until the vaccine has fully gone through the, the population and people have accepted to take it and all that. But I, I would say, listen, plan for the marathon. And, and if it ends up being a sprint, great. Uh, but be prepared for that emotionally, mentally, and, and plan accordingly. And we're, we're probably gonna go through peaks and valleys. You know, the only reason the Europeans have decided to do a major shutdown now is to save Christmas. Um, that's why they did dec declared the shutdown because if they continued on the path they were in, then Christmas was gonna be a total disaster from an economical point of view. And they know that the upside of Christmas from a financial point of view is, is worth a lot more than, than the loss that's gonna take place over the next two to three weeks. And, and that's why they did what they're doing. And that's why a lot of countries are having to do that. Hopefully we don't have to do this in New York City, but I think um, Q1 2022 is when we start breathing normally. Yeah, Blair. I mean, that feels like so far away. I, 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 don't, I don't disagree. I think there's a lot of uh, truth in what you guys are saying. Um, I'm choosing to be 
optimistic, not even cautiously optimistic, just regular optimistic because it doesn't cost me anything. But I am proceeding as if it could stay this way for a while. Um, for me, that means I don't plan on bringing back any more staff. Um, it means that my new schedule of working all the time stays that way um, indefinitely. So I, while I agree, uh, I, I am very hopeful that come spring, come some warmer weather and possibly come a vaccine that there, there will be substantial changes to our industry. I think that we can only hope. Okay, last question from me. Um, after going through this, we're still in it obviously, but uh, do you see any opportunities coming out of COVID? Tons oh. of opportunities. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah, I, see, I do see tons of opportunities. I think that um, having been on both sides, closing a place, running a place, um, loving both of those restaurants equally as if they're my children. I think that the places that do survive, um, it's going to be a totally different landscape. And I think that we will hopefully all do very well. Um, I think that we have all learned to do less with more. So perhaps that means that we will- All with less. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so perhaps we will be able to be even more profitable yes. um, once, once things sort of level out, because I think as a society, really, we were a little bit spoiled, really. You know, we could, if we wanted a chicken sandwich at 2 a.m., we could find it somewhere. That has not been the case for a little while now. So I just think that um, people have changed. And while we've said that that happened with 9-11 and people changed back, perhaps with our industry, things will, um, they, they will continue to go maybe in a way that there will be a loyalty and a feeling of um, just warmth to the places that have survived. Yeah. Now, I think Jeffrey and Philippe, and I know Trinesse hopped off, we're not continuing to run our restaurants just for the financial aspect of it. There is a love, I think, that we all have for our business. Um, we've all talked about the warmth we feel towards our staff, towards the communities that we're a part of. And I think that those people will continue to support us um, throughout and hopefully for years to come. Okay. Very good. Uh, Philippe? Final answer. You're on mute. Sorry, I dozed off on my computer screen. Um, um, what opportunities do you see coming out of COVID? Um, I think uh, hopefully landlords uh, will be more willing to accept percentage deals. Number That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I think um, that those of us that have brands that are ready to grow uh, will have opportunities to take those brands into a growth mode, uh, assuming the capital is there. Um, and um, I, listen, if we go back to 1918, uh, you had the roaring 20s, right? Uh, and then after them again. <laughs> and then uh, there is so much pent up demand for living, for life, for celebration. Um, I think. Uh, it's all about, like I said, it's surviving the storm and then being ready to pick the fruit. Um, yeah. My biggest concern is the office space, the office world. Uh, that's something that might be transformed or changed. And, and we don't know yet right. what that's going to look. But uh, yeah. All right, Jeffrey, let's bring it home. Uh, my, the opportunities I see are always negative. I see the opportunity to pay higher taxes and have higher wages. A higher minimum wage is going to come down the pike. I think we're all kidding ourselves. Um, I think it's going to be a brutal two years, but I do think there's a lot of opportunities. I agree. I'm, I'm kidding a little. That if you survive this, you'll be the last one, you know, you know, on the raft, and there'll be a lot of opportunities. I, and I, you know, we're big believers in the best uh, deals are the ones you walk away from. There's a ton of opportunities, so don't get you know overly excited tomorrow. There's going to be unfortunately a lot of space available. A lot of people aren't going to survive this, unfortunately. 
Um, I think what people need to focus on is don't be afraid of technology, embrace it, and, but only take technology if it's not gonna affect the quality of your food or service. So if you can find a way to have hidden technology and ways that can make your life a little easier, great, because you're gonna need it to be more efficient because we're gonna, you know, we're at $15 an hour now, the rest of the country's about to catch up. So what do you think's about to happen? We're gonna be hitting, you know, people are gonna be pushing for $20 very quickly once the rest of the country gets up to 15. New York always has to stay ahead. Um, and taxes, someone's gotta pay for the $3 trillion we just gave out and more to come. As much as I'm sitting here begging for more, someone's gonna have to pay for that. So there's gonna be, you know, you have to find some efficiencies to offset the taxes and, and the pay rates that have come down the pike. There's gonna be a lot of opportunities. I think we all learn how to work leaner for sure, which unfortunately is the word for not as many people employed. So that's not so great either because then we have people that don't have jobs. Um, so that makes me nervous too. Um, but at the end of the day, there's gonna be a ton of opportunities and just you know go slowly and always make sure, is this on brand for me? And if it is, you know, it's a good opportunity to take, but I do think you'll finally, for the first time in decades, be in a much better driver's seat with your landlords um, for the first time in a while. Awesome. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, great answers. Uh, thank you all to the panelists uh, and the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Uh, Savannah, is there any last questions before we wrap? No, I think we're good to go. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Blair, Jeffrey, Philippe. Uh, I know Trinette said to hop off, but so grateful for your insight. And uh, thank you so much again to everyone who is in attendance today. We hope you found this um, insightful and hope that you will join us again next week. Again, for more information on uh, continuing discussions and the Alliance, our membership, our advocacy efforts, please do visit our website, thenycalliance.org. Um, and always feel free to message us, sign up for our newsletters. We can answer any questions. And thank you so much. Great conversation. Thank you.